Hello and welcome to this conference. Bonjour et bienvenue à tous et toutes. I warmly thank the High Commissioner of South Africa, Mr. Sheikh, for accepting our invitation. It is quite natural to us to welcome a major player from what is now commonly called the Global South to talk to us about the profound changes that the world is experiencing and will experience in the coming years. The affirmation of countries from the South seems inevitable and completely natural. It is now underway after difficult beginnings illustrated by the non-aligned movement and the Bandung Conference, the new international economic order outlined at the Algier Conference in 1973 and adopted by consensus by the United Nations General Assembly in 1974. This initiative then were met by a clear and unequivocal refusal of Western powers keen to maintain their preeminence and resistant to any idea of equitable sharing or redistribution of resources. Of course, the context has changed a lot in 50 years. The Bandung moment has passed. That being said, the emergence of the BRICS, their desire to play a leading role on the international scene, and the rejection of a Western directoire of world affairs are reshaping the configuration of power. These new realities are of course linked to the effort and development of the global South in general. But we must also recognize that the Western powers have made a lot of mistakes, have dilapidated their moral heritage from the Second World War, and have increased armed intervention in the name of an international order that they no longer even respect. But this devaluation of Western speech is not without danger for the rest of the world. The powers never disappear voluntarily or uncheerfully. Their upheaval can be met with great violence. Thus, during the American unipolar moment, which was certainly a moment of confidence and affirmation of American power, the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs at Brown University tells us in a project entitled Cost of War that since 9-11, American military intervention directly cost the lives of almost a million per people and indirectly 3.6 to 3.8 million people. This moral and military adventurism would have cost the American Treasury more than $8 trillion. And to use the title of the High Commissioner, a, pot a potential catastrophe is looming if American power does not accept this progressive erosion of its global preeminence. It is not the only cause, of course, but an important one. In this regard, we can hope that a country like South Africa can contribute to a passing of the baton of power in peace and harmony, a very difficult mission. Western power can no longer teach the world because they have behaved without regard for the rules or the law that they constantly urge others to respect. This rebalancing of world powers is a good thing, and Western powers should not steal themselves against this new reality, but seek ways to peacefully collaborate in the advent of a world that we hope is more just and truly respectful of the law that international actors set for themselves. The world is now multipolar, and cooperation is established according to the interest of states. This is certainly a realist vision of international relations. This realism cannot prevent more egalitarian relationship based in part on a moral vision, which without being completely devoid of political ulterior motives, could be based on a refresh reading of international law and taking into account in this interpretation of colonial and post-colonial history. Uh, not everyone likes it, but the story didn't, didn't begin in 1945. In fact, the post-war software of 1945 is no longer valid. It's just a frozen figure from a past that no longer exists. The challenges are major, and transition periods are very dangerous. Is it useful to uh, recall Antonio Gramsci in our classic phrase, the old world is dying, the new world is slow to appear, and, he, and in this chiaroscuro, clairobscur, monsters emerge. I thank the High Commissioner again for being with us today. 
The question period will follow His Excellency conference. It will be led by Thibault uh, Biscay, postdoctoral researchers at the Centre de Recherche en République. Bonne conférence, merci. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for having me. My apologies for not doing this in French. Uh, I am married to a woman who was born in Montreal. Uh, but then when Montreal was getting, or Quebec was getting a bit noisy, uh, being of Anglophone, she then left to Ottawa, ended up in Nepal because her dad worked for SNC Lavalin. And I eventually met her in Algiers when she was working for the United Nations, dealing with the issue of the uh, Saharawi people. And I hope you would all know what the Saharawi people are. There's a struggle for self-determination of the Western Sahara. What the professor did not tell you is that at the end of this discussion, I would be handing out a test, which I will be grading. Uh, so I hope you are going to pay due attention to the matters. So we live in very interesting times, and I've entitled this discussion, Living in the Shadow of Catastrophe. I should. I should tell you that I am a insomniac, which basically means I do not get much sleep, and I try to make sense of the world, which my agitated mind tries to arrive at a narrative so that we can explain, at least to ourselves, what is the type of world we are living in. So what you are going to see here is the culmination of work in progress. It is not yet complete, uh, but I think it's sufficient where I can put it out there for discussion purposes. So don't take anything that I say as the gospel truth. It is just my agitations, my reflections. To the extent that it represents similarities to my government's position, I am comfortable that I have the latitude to speak in the name of my government. And I think once I present this to them, they too will accept the, the approach that I'm trying to articulate here. I think there are some seats in the front if you want to come through. The, so having gone through all of that, let's get to it. So we would... Uh, we would uh, what I do have here, and now I've got to turn, Zitten Vender, that is a historical turning point, uh, the age of disorder, the age of fragmentation, an emerging new order. These are all the things that, if you're a political scientist or even if you are legal scholars, you will see that these terms define the kind of language that we are living in. But they do in fact reflect, in my opinion, a manifestation of multiple crises that's occurring in the world. Uh, and you as being the young a lot will experience this differently. It is the zeitgeist, it is the spirit of uncertainty. So all of us feel somehow that we are living in uncertain times. And we're all wondering what is our own futures in these uncertain times. But this is the feeling, this intuition by which we speak of. We know that something is evolving. We feel that change is happening. And we all have different relationships to this change but we can feel it intuitively, it is happening. It's a period, and I always get this word wrong, interregnum. And the interregnum, as the professor said earlier, is that wonderful period 
of described by Gramsci that says that the old is dying and the new cannot be born. So we get a sense, right? So whether it's the unipolar moment or the unilateral world, or is it a multipolar world? What are the rules that apply differently? So intuitively we feel something is happening, some change is occurring, and we don't quite have a handle on it. I'm going to be a little bit provocative because I have immunity, uh, so I cannot be challenged or, or punished. Uh, for example, let's talk about a fault line that exists in Canada. The Anglophone Francophone fault line. Now, that fault line, in my opinion, as a South African, it is erupting. It's exploding. How it is going to be managed, nobody knows, but we all know that it is happening. So that's the kind of feeling I want you to have in your mind when you interrogate this presentation of mine. It is a feeling that something is changing, but we don't quite know what it is and why it is happening. So, I've been working with an institute called the Cascade Institute. Uh, it's based in, in BC and by, headed by a very, very clever person who have had the same agitations as I, I have. His name is uh, Dixon Homer, Todd, Tad Dixon Homer. And in the Cascade Institute, they have developed this concept which has been developing in itself called polycrisis. So much of what you're going to see now is the kind of mechanisms by which we are trying to understand polycrisis. But the fundamental thesis is that planet Earth and all the systems that define and shape the progression of life on Earth is undergoing a unique polycrisis. So that is the description. I buy into this. I believe it is true, and I will show to you why it is <coughs> true. But what is a polycrisis? Right? So we use a big word, uh, polycrisis. What is a polycrisis. Well, very simply put, a polycrisis, a global polycrisis, occurs when crises in multiple global systems become casually entangled in ways that significantly degrade humanity's prospect for human security. So it is the systems that we all live in is starting to interact in a way in which it is producing negative and seriously negative outcomes. These interacting crises produce harms greater than the sum of those crises would produce in isolation, where the whole system not so deeply interconnected. So because of the interconnection of the systems, that the overall harm that is produced is greater than the individual harm that will come from only one system. So these are two important criteria. But then, what is a crisis? Because we went to a polycrisis, then what is a crisis? So very simply put, a crisis is a sudden event or series of events that significantly harms in a relatively short period of time the well-being of a large number of people. That's a crisis. So you can immediately conclude that COVID 19 was a very significant crisis. Short period of time, a lot of people were affected, but then when you examine COVID in a different context, you'll see that it is a very key component of polycrisis. So in understanding crises, you've got to understand stresses, which is a slow process, and then triggers that happens very fast. Example, the Anglophone, Francophone contradiction in Canada is a slow process. The trigger has been whether you limit, I've got to be very careful here, whether you limit 
students who do not speak French coming into Quebec or, you know that, that, that thing? Well, that's a trigger to a slow process. Mm. Of course, it's going to have a countermeasure somewhere, and it's just a matter of what that consequence is going to be. Another example. Contradiction in Canada doesn't have a large population for this vast country. Solution, bring in immigration, bring in students, bring in people. 500,000 a year, great. But then there was a housing crisis, and the consequence of the housing crisis means stop the students coming in. All right? So you can see what I'm talking about from your own lived experience that we are in what we call a unique polycrisis. In South Africa, we have the same thing. So everyone says that the problem in the past was that we didn't allow black people to vote. Mm, that's not apartheid. Apartheid was a fundamental system of underdevelopment that produced underdevelopment, poverty, and inequality. The expression of that was apartheid. It was race-based. So now that we have solved the race-based contradiction, we can all vote. Have we solved the unemployment? Have we solved the underdevelopment? Have we solved the inequalities? No. In fact, South Africa today is the most unequal society in the world in a period in which we have enjoyed 30 years of democracy because the slow processes take a long time to get resolved and the trigger to those processes are much easier to solve and they push your crises in a particular way. So I want you to understand trigger which is faster and the slow processes. Am I losing everybody? Are, are you still with me? Okay. So, you have stresses, and stresses affect different systems. In, in health, the aging population affects the economy, and it affects health. So you'll notice again that our health systems in Canada is under a particular form of stress. You'll also notice that your economy is under a particular form of stress because you need to increase productivity and for that you need young people working. And in fact, in our country, in my country, most of the young people who are qualified cannot find jobs because the economy is not generating jobs. We then have one system can affect another system which can affect the third system. So energy can affect food. If you take in South Africa, we're having a serious collapse of our energy systems which is having a serious problem on food production, which is creating social disorder because now we have rising levels of poverty. So I want you to see the cascade of systems problem. And then, of course, you have interactions or the casual interaction between systems, economy and governance. I've just taken these as examples. So, there it is. Now, let's look at this. So if you understand all the things I've been telling you before, you will see that this is global polycrisis. Maybe I should turn this way now, right? So we can all do it together. You remember a time in which we had a housing crisis in the United States of America? It was a big bubble. The banks were too big to fail. So quantitative easing went in. Money was poured to save the banks because money went into the banks, printed by government. 
That led to ultra-loose credit. When the pandemic happened, grants were given to people because they had to survive. Again, government issued more money that created ultra-loose credit. The ultra-loose credit affected inflation. So inflation has gone up. Inflation led to increased economic insecurity. Interest rates had to go up. Bank interest rates are going up. And consequences is people in the middle class can no longer afford interest rates, can no longer afford to pay for their mortgages, and you're going to find increasing problems there. But the thing that I want to point out to you here, the pandemic gave you supply disruptions, and then came the Russians. The Russian-Ukraine war, the Israel-Palestinian war, which I'll come to, increased migration, affected the supply disruptions, and now you can see how almost everything is affecting each other in different ways. And the outcome there is the higher risk of interstate war and a global collapse of global climate regimes because the more we're engaging in war, the less cooperation we have to tackle the fundamental problem of climate change. So this is not a nice story. But the way to understand that complicated map is to look at it this way. Hmm? To say these are all the systems we have in the world, and these systems operate either in a positive or negative feedback loop. So let's just take what war does. Right? So war has a positive effect on military spending. If you are engaging in war, just ask the Ukrainians, the Russian, and now the Israelis, that if you engage in war, you need to increase your military spending. If you increase your military spending, you do not have the same resources to engage in climate action. If you do not engage in climate action, food prices are going to go up. So everything here is engaged in either a positive or a negative feedback loop. And when you see all of this taken across international security, domestic governance, food, energy, the economy, environment, you are asking yourself one question. Where do you start to solve this problem? Where do you start? to fix this problem. And this is why you need systems thinking if you want to tackle any one of these issues. And I'll come back to that systems thinking in a moment. So <clears throat> do follow polycrisis.org. Polycrisis.org, Get onto this website. There's some interesting articles there. There are interesting thinking there that which will be very helpful in your broader understanding of the world. Uh, and I'll come and I'll come to this. Now, the important thing I want to say to you is on the international cooperation, there's that world word called rules of the world order. Bear that in mind. Professor and I had an earlier discussion where he used the word law, and I was so happy he used the word law because I believe in law, I do not believe in rules. See, rules are given to you by your parents. These are the rules by which your life should live. But you see, it's parent-child. Hmm? There's a very unique description of the power relationship between a parent and a child. The parent has the power. The child has only the obligation to follow the rules of the parent. So when we talk about the rising south, global south, 
we're talking about we no longer want to abide by rules. We want to abide by law. And there's a fundamental difference in that, but let me not get ahead of myself, I will come to that. So I used all of that thinking, <coughs> and I've been struggling with this concept. It looked like it is particular fixed things, but I want to explain, and I've got to do this by hand, the word entropy. So let's just take you on the horizontal axis first. There's the word entropy written there, and the words negentropy. So entropy is essentially the movement towards chaos according to the inherent fault lines of any organization, organism, or individual. All of us in this room are going to die at one point. That's a fact of life. I'm not putting any bad spell. It's a fact of life. The things from which most of you are going to die from, you have it already. It is in your DNA. It is in your system. It is there. The disease from which most of us will die from, I'm taking away accidents and all of that, uh, most of us will die from the things that is already in us. It's in our mutation of our DNA. Our environment can cause that to trigger. It can, if we live unhealthy lives, well, those diseases are going to come sooner rather than later. But it is already there. So that, understand that word entropy. Negentropy is what do we do to hold back this pull towards chaos? What do we do to push it back? And that's called negentropy. So I was using or attempted to use these two scientific concepts to political institutions. On the vertical side, what you have is vulnerability, resilience, anti-fragility. So anti-fragility is going up, but of course the reverse is fragility is increasing if you're going down. Now, what is uh, fragility? Well, fragility is a weakness in any structure that happens when it happens, right? It is fragile, it breaks. Anti-fragility is what is in that structure that allows it to absorb a shock and to actually get stronger, and that is anti-fragility. So the important thing here is to understand entropy. So when entropy is increasing, the important thing is to increase the anti-fragility because you want to do that. No matter what the entropy is, you want to ensure that you have sufficient anti-fragility. And all this con comes from the concept, uh, would, you, would you have heard of someone called Nalib, uh, Nassim Talib? His, uh, Nassim Talib wrote about the Black Swan event and his book on anti-fragility. I would really recommend that book to you uh, about understanding fragility and risk, but not, not in the economic sense, but more in the political economic sense. So what we have here is different states. You'll see you'll have unfavorable order, you have favorable order, and then you have utopia. As you go up the, the, the vertical axis, you are increasing the anti-fragility component, and you're moving towards utopia. But then you have these four other things. When your entropy is low, you would have unfavorable order. Post-1945 was unfavorable order. United Nations Security Council, 5, P5, there was order in the world. It was unfavorable for the rest, but favorable for that five. They were power. And everyone believed in it because we believe that we will go to favorable order, where everything will be good for everybody. And then if we work on that, we build the resilience 
of our multilateral systems, we will go to utopia. Well, that didn't quite happen. But you understand the concept. Unfavorable order, favorable order, moving towards utopia, not a bad thing. But then what happens when the entropy increases? You go to favorable disorder. Yes, there is favorable disorder. It is disorder for some, it is favorable for the others. And you know what we call that? Take it down. Rules-based international order is nothing more than favorable disorder. It is favorable for a set of nations. It is not favorable for another set of nations, and the order is actually disorder. But if that situation is allowed to occur and has been occurring, and when the institutions become more fragile, favorable disorder moves towards unfavorable disorder where everyone starts to suffer the fragility, which is exactly what we are living in now. And if the unfavorable disorder continues, if you don't deal with the, the, the the poly crises, then you move because entropy is going to move you into catastrophe. And that is why I argued that the title of this discourse is Living in the Shadow of Catastrophe, because that is exactly where we are. But there's a positive side to the story. And the positive side to the story is do not forget negentropy. If we have sufficient negentropy, we can reverse the effects of entropy. Because it is entropy that is pushing us in the direction of catastrophe, and it is the fragility of the multilateral system that is bringing us down. So, now I think I've got your attention. So let's see what increases entropy. P5, Professor spoke about Pax Americana. Then we had the world of deterrence. Do not use nuclear weapons. We both sides will have nuclear weapons, but do not use it. We then had the Cold War. Right? We are really going to have this battle between socialism and capitalism, and that Cold War ravaged the world especially countries in the South. And then we got the unipolar moment. And the unipolar moment was when someone, or one country in particular, decided, you know what? We can act in our national interest at the expense of everybody else. Collapse of the Soviet Union. China started rising. End of history. Remember the big debate about the end of history uh, Samuel, I forget his surname now, uh, Francis Sukuyama, yeah? End of history, uh, then started a new debate, a new language that started to emerge called rule-based international order. And the rules-based international order gave you the coalition of the willing. And the coalition of the willing could impose the rule-based international order onto the rest. Libya. I was there. We tried so hard to get the French, to get the British, to say do not bomb Libya. Because the consequences you cannot imagine. Let me tell you one of the consequences. Under this coalition of the willing, an enormous amount of arms were thrown into the Sahara because they believed that if the weapons were in the Sahara, the rebels, the kingdoms of Libya would be able to get these weapons and topple Gaddafi. Well, 
let's just forget about the Qaddafi story because we know what happened. But those weapons are today fueling a secessionary movement in Mozambique, which is near my, right next to South Africa. So these weapons have gone all over Africa, creating an enormous amount of challenges that you cannot solve. I'm saying this because, mark my words, in five years' time, I will come back here, and we're going to have a discussion about armed revolutionary movements in Europe as a result of all the weapons that have been put, put into Ukraine will be spreading throughout Europe, creating mayhem and chaos. Because that is what happens when you put weapons in any place. Uncontrolled weapons gets distributed through channels that we do not understand, through the polycrisis channels, creating problems that you did not even predict when you started off. Then come NATO. So NATO now is your new security council. What NATO decides will be imposed on the rest of the world. So whenever you have discussions about NATO, you must ask yourself, who is NATO? What is their mandate? What law, international law, is NATO operating under? And who supervises or holds NATO to account for the humanitarian crisis that results from their actions? Well, you want an answer? Yeah. We are signaling by our action in ICJ that we are going to start holding institutions, individuals, accountable for their action in terms of international law. Because that's the only weapon we have, international law. And every international law must apply to everyone equally. It cannot any longer apply selectively to some and not to others. I forget I'm an ambassador and I shouldn't be a revolutionary. Sorry. Uh, okay, so weaponizing of the United Nations. We have seen that happening over and over again. And again, the Libya thing is very instructive. In the United Nations debate about Libya, and you recall those debates, maybe you were too young, but there was the issue of the responsibility to protect. Responsibility to protect. And within the United Nations, there was the debate that there is a responsibility of the United Nations to protect the citizens of Libya from an imminent genocide. Hey, I used that word, sorry. Uh, and I want to say it again. The debates in the United Nations was about the use of the United Nations Security Council based on the responsibility to protect Libyan citizens who were in danger of an imminent genocide. And then a little clause was added, by all means necessary. What we didn't know, because my country agreed with that resolution. Much to our eternal shame, we agreed with that resolution. What we didn't know, but that resolution and that word by all means necessary meant that NATO was going to bomb Libya back into the Stone Ages. And I'm sure all of you have traveled to Libya because it's such a great country to go to now its tourism is great, its economy is booming, the people are so happy, Gaddafi is gone, and the country is wonderfully surviving. How we wish that was the case. But it is not. So the weaponizing of the United Nations started. So this all has increased the entropy. 
that we've, there's no trust in the world, there's no belief that we're acting together for the sake of common good, and this is causing great ruptions. But then what created the fragility of the United Nations system? Globalized financial capital, inequality, way gone, and you've all read the recent Stats Canada paper about inequality in Canada. The billionaires just became more billionaires in Canada. And I love Canada because you don't see the billionaires. Because in this, you know, <clears throat> okay, so I know I can look at the clothes here and I know some of you have some very expensive clothing. So I too like to dress up a little bit. And there's a store that is, I know it is here in Montreal, it's definitely in Toronto, and there's one in, in Ottawa. It's called Harry Rosen's. Did any of you guys know about Harry Rosen's? Yeah? He, died he died recently, right? But what a store. It's a beautiful, beautiful store. You go in there and you feel you just got to buy the stuff. Well, unfortunately, I cannot afford to buy the stuff at Harry Rosen's. But yet, Harry Rosen's everywhere has big stores. Somebody is buying stuff at Harry Rosen's, right? It can't, I mean, and I'm telling you, okay, I don't earn that bad as a high commissioner. Um, it comes more in perks that I don't have to pay for housing and energy and so forth. That's, that's the perks we get. But I can still not afford to go to Harry Rosen. But somebody is going there because it is open. It's big. It's expanding. And you know in terms of business models that if your business model is not working, you will shut the place down. So the thing about Canada that I love is that the billionaires and the elites are invisible. But I wonder for how long that will be the case. My daughter, who is 12 years old, got into this thing about, camp. is it camp? Yeah, you call it camps, right? In, in July, you go for a camp. So she goes to a camp, and I'm, you know, I'm this backward African. I don't understand this concept of camp going in, because for me, camp was old days, you take a tent, you go into the bush, you put it out there, you live with your friends, you have the most miserable time, but you all pretend that it is the most wonderful time, right? So, but it's miserable, so I cannot get my head around camps. So. My daughter has been going for this camp for two years, and this time around, I said, no, I am coming to see this camp. I'm not going to name the camp, but this is a camp that is going on for generations. So they have this parents' lunch thing, so you go there and you sit and you eat sandwiches. And then you listen to the dialogue that's happening, Professor, it's fantastic. Oh, you know, my great-grandmother was here, and my grandmother came, and my mother came, and now my daughter's here. So it's like a generational thing, right? It's not a cheap place. And I looked around, and the most amazing thing I saw, not one black person. Not one black person. And I said, I couldn't figure this, because this is a very equal society. This is a very equal country. There should at least be a, a sparkling of a few blacks here. No. 100 kids were there, one brown person. And I thought, this also doesn't make sense. So there's something about caste. Caste. And uh, we don't like the term because it like, comes from India, right? Uh, but caste is about how you keep invisible the sharp class demarcations in your society. Mm -hmm. And you know that thing, this caste thing? 
It's rumbling. It's rumbling in Canada. Pay attention to it. Pay attention to that the most marginalized in your society right now are people of color. Most marginalized in your society now is indigenous people. It's rumbling. From my sense, I can see this polycrisis rumbling. Just pay attention to it. Think about it, especially as you are growing up. But that's the inequality part. And inequality always starts invisible until it becomes very, very visible. And I would love to hear a debate between Pierre Polev and uh, Trudeau on inequality. Interesting. But Ukraine-Russian conflict, we saw that the UN unable to solve that problem. And that problem just goes on and on and on because the UN is unable to solve it. One side of the debate will always veto the other side of the debate. Inflation and low growth, well, welcome to the new world. Inflation and low growth is almost permanent now. Supply chain disruption. As the COVID came to be, there was supply chain disruption. First you had from the supply side, and now you have it from the demand side. Uh, it's just amazing how supply chains, where the supply side or demand side and the disruption in those chains is affecting our lives. West versus the rest. Increasingly, there's the debate about, hmm, it's the West versus the rest. About a hundred and, we saw it in most of the uh, recent UN resolutions, that you can take a large chunk of the world and put it on one side, and then you can take a small part of the world and put it on another side, and the two just don't seem to be able to agree. That's the West versus the rest. Palestine-Israel conflict. I know that you have specific questions about that. I will deal with it. Oh, by the way, Friday, this Friday, 7 a.m. Canadian time, listen to the judgment of the ICJ, because they've announced today they will be giving the judgment at 7, I think it's 7 a.m. Canadian time. It's 1 p.m. in The Hague. I'll give you my views on that. Uh, but we have the dysfunctionality of the UN security system. So I was trying to understand why are these things happening and how did all this start to happen? I'm going to take you very quickly through because I think I'm running out of time, Professor, right? Uh, let's start from the 1979 conservative revolutions. So in 1979, a few remarkable things happened in the world. The conservatives came to power. Started off with Thatcher. Iranian revolution uh, as well. Conservative uh, the Khomeini took over, got rid of the Tudor party, which was uh, Marxist leaning, uh, and, the, and Afghan at the same time, the USSR invaded Afghan. So the conservative order started to develop. Globalization was a very interesting thing. Free movements of good people, uh, so we started to embrace globalization. Globalization started to produce just in time. It drove efficiency in business models. You want just in time goods. So you had just in time uh, supply chains. It was truly a period in which there was end of geography. Things that were made in China or Asia could be delivered to the United States and all along the way, it could happen seamlessly. And people were hailing that as the end of geography. Globalized financial capitalism started to develop. 
Now, it may come as a shock to you that most of the major corporates today do not make their money from producing goods. They make their money in terms of what, how they sweat their capital. And this capital can move very quickly from place to place. And globalized financial capitalism is the new mode of production. And this money moves, and it's a large amount of money, for example, and you should be very, very, very happy about it because you control 1.2 trillion worth of it. Your pension funds. The Canadian pension funds are the best in the world. It has this enormous amount of capital, which it uses to invest elsewhere to give you the returns for you to have a great life. Uh, that's an example of globalized financial capitalism. The people who control equities, I don't know if any, are they all lawyers here, are going to be lawyers? Yeah, so if you really are looking for great jobs, go and work as the uh, legal counsel for equity firms, big financial institutions, uh, because that is where the real action is, is happening. Don't end up like me, uh, who will be analyzing your work, but you will be doing it. There's a transition from tangible to intangible economies. Now, the thing that I can understand, and which I love, is Lululemon. You know Lululemon? You go to Lululemon store, and you ask for something, and say, no, we don't, we don't have it. You, but you can get it on our, uh, what do you call it? Online. online. You can get it online. And the first time I heard it, I thought, oh, very interesting. Uh, and then I said, ma'am, are you aware that you have just done yourself out of a job? Because if I could get everything online, why are you going to be here? Right, and the person couldn't understand what I was saying, uh, but the economy is moving towards intangible economies, big time. How many of us uh, shop through Amazon? Come on, come on, guys. <laughs> Most of us do the shopping through Amazon, right? The problem with that is the pop and mop, uh, pop and mom and pop shops close. Mm -hmm. They all close because now you just need a singular warehouse, automation, AI, can move things, get your goods. You don't need these other shops. So be careful of the inefficiencies that you like in life. It may come at a price. So there's that transition taking place, but that transition produces economic choices which I want to argue categorically serves the elites. So you get elite beneficiation from the economic choices we make. And that produces other choices. It goes back in, into a loop because the world now is moving to greater, greater, greater debt. Uh, and this debt servicing is a problem. It's a problem in my country. It's a problem in most developing countries where we're going to have to tackle. And the only way you tackle debt is that you cut government services. And the more you cut government services, the more disorder you produce in the world. So those of you who believe that <coughs> you must cut government services, well, think about it again. Uh, you will have serious challenges. Great disappointment and the great divide and with the great disappointment that we're all feeling our lives are not good, we're having this identity crisis. So let's make America great again. Eh? You're a country of immigrants. You want to make it great again. When were you ever great? When you committed genocide? When, when were you ever great? But rise of identity. And this is what is driving the popular right movement in, in Europe. And it is unfortunate for me to tell you it's going to drive the rise of the popular right even in Canada. But in the meantime, what we're having is climate change. 
and the effects of climate change is real. You know the wildfires that happened here in, in Canada? So we were fortunate to the extent that we could, we developed a economic model. We have millions of unemployed people in South Africa, massive unemployment problems. So our government came up with a crazy idea. If the government could train people in certain skills that is needed elsewhere in the world, we can then export our labor uh, to elsewhere in the world, and then once they are here, they can come back. So all the firefighters that we sent to Canada, 1,200, I think, we sent in about four ships, were all trained through our unemployment programs. Trained them to be firefighters, made sure they got skills, had an arrangement with the Canadian government, and sent them to... to to the north, basically, where the fires were. So I had reason to discuss with the, the managers of this about, tell me why are these fires occurring? And because you'll recall that it happened just past the winter, just immediately past last year's winter, lots of snow, how is it possible? Because my understanding, layman terms, snow, water, the water will seep into the ground and the fires will not happen. Well, not true. Basically because you know the 10 to 1 ratio, that for every 10 meters of snow you have 1 meter of water. But if there is global warming, the evaporation takes place much faster. So the snow evaporates, very little water is getting into the ground, and as a result, the fires and the peat, which is there, caught a light through a lightning strike. So in fact, it is under the ground that is burning. And this is why a very unique phenomenon in the trees, the trees where you couldn't see which tree was burning. You'll see smoke coming out of the pine tree, and then it explodes, which catches the fire, because it's burning from under the ground as a result of climate change. But we're not having the kind of discussions we need to have about climate change because it is already affecting all our lives. In my country, we are trapped between severe drought and massive floods. Our infrastructure in the city that I was born in, in KwaZulu-Natal, Durban, has literally been washed away by massive, massive storms. None of the infrastructure any of us built was built with the mindset of climate change, extreme weather events, because they were built 30, 40 years ago. So that's a real challenge. But I'm getting those looks that I need to go faster, so I want to come back to this international cooperation. I honestly believe that if we want to solve any one of these problems, we have to start with international cooperation. We have to agree globally that we need a new way of working together, we need a new way of tackling problems, and to have the kind of maturity and the discussions to have difficult conversations. So South Africa's foreign policy, we're nearing the end. It's very simple to understand. It's a better life for all, all South Africans, Africa, and all the people of the world. So if you really want to understand South Africa's foreign policy, it is a better life for all, for all South Africans, for all Africans, and all people of the world. And what we wish for ourselves, we wish for others, and that is called intermestic, it is the interconnectedness between domestic and foreign policy. This is why we have no contradiction between what is our domestic policy and what is our foreign policy, because we don't have make South Africa great again slogans. We say better life for all. And we include greater humanity to all, and that comes at a price. 
give you an example. In 1994, our population was maybe 38 million, 1994. The infrastructure we had served 7 million people by 1994, mainly white. Post-94, immediately 28th of thing, uh, April, the same infrastructure that served 7 million had to serve 38 million. Today, our population is close to 60 million. The same infrastructure that serves 7 million is serving 60 million people. That is a case of collapse. And that is what we're experiencing. We're experiencing across the board collapse. So then people ask us, okay, if you've got all these domestic problems, why the hell are you bothered about Palestine? It is a legitimate question if you do not understand what we mean by a better life for all. Yes, we must tackle our problems, but how can we remain silent when what we see happening in Palestine happening? Because it means that we've got to value other lives more important, we value our lives more important than other people's lives and that brings the divide between domestic and foreign. And unfortunately, for better or for worse, we simply cannot make that division. We may be wrong in the world, the eyes of the world, but it is what we believe in, and we are committed to that process, and I'm hoping that many of you are gonna ask me questions about that, which I will answer. We believe in multilateralism, we believe in international law, rather than this rule-based international order, which we see nothing other than unilateralism. That's what it is. So we believe in a multilateral system. We believe of the centrality of the multilateral system in global affairs. And we believe that the organization called the United Nations must play a central role in the management of conflict, in security, and in development of the world. Again, we make no apology for these beliefs and we accept that you may think we are wrong, but we believe very strongly in it. All conflicts must be resolved through negotiations and if there's ever a consistency of our views is that all conflicts must be solved through negotiations. And here's the fantastic hypocrisy that we see in the world. When we were killing ourselves, the whole world, in particular the West, demanded of us to negotiate. Bah, me. In fact, the eminence person group, of which a Canadian was very much part of, traveled to South Africa, met with the African National Congress, which I'm a member of, to say, you must negotiate. And we thought about it and said, you know, this is a very valid point. We must negotiate. Why are we fighting? And the moment we took the decision that we want to negotiate, we unilaterally suspended the armed struggle. Unilaterally. We had all the moral justification to continue our war against an apartheid regime, which is a crime against humanity, but we unilaterally suspended our armed struggles because we believe that we could solve our problems through negotiations. And the man who drove that thinking, well, it is <coughs> none other than our glorious leader, Nelson Mandela, who had a very simple argument. We can continue this war and we can inherit a country that is burnt to the ground, or we can negotiate and find a way forward. And we embrace negotiations. Now, it is so hard for me to tell you that because I was one of those militants who did not believe in negotiations. I believed 
and you can see I have the personality, I believe that we needed to fight to the last man standing. I really did. But he grabbed me by my ear, he threw me into the negotiation process and changed my life in the process. So negotiations, all conflicts can be solved through negotiations. There is no justification for war. No justification. Sanctions is not a weapon of war. We must not use sanctions, which is part of the international law toolkit, agreed by everyone, to use it as a weapon of war because it produces, it devalues the international uh, spirit behind the use of sanctions. And when we do use it as a weapon, we should make sure we have UN approval. So I think I have agitated you enough for you to come at me whichever which way you want to, uh, and I'm here to answer your questions. Thank you, Professor. <laughs>